Well, good morning and welcome. And uh, if you're here in person, then uh, you are some of the survivors from COVID over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I know we've got uh, quite a number at the moment who are we watching from online and who have got various family members feeling poorly. So we do hope uh, you're blessed for the ministry this morning and uh, we do hope you'll make a full recovery. Uh, we've got a number of people preaching away as well, uh, hence some of the big gaps. Uh, but it's good to be together. It's good to be together to worship the Lord. And uh, the psalmist says this. The psalmist says, Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. And our hope this morning is that we are reminded of the awesomeness of God and that we are stirred to sing praises to his name. And we're going to try and do justice to his awesomeness as we begin this morning by singing. And we're going to sing number 143, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds. Number 143, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds. take a seat and in just a moment Simon's going to come and uh, give us our notices for this morning uh, but first of all let's just pray Lord we do want to join with the psalmist and say to you how awesome are your deeds and Lord we might ask you might help us this morning to reflect on these things 
Uh, help us, help the children in Sunday school, and help us to, to worship you as we ought. Lord, we've just sung, weak is the effort of my heart, and cold my warmest thought, and uh, so often that is true of us. But we do ask you might help us to see thee as thou art, and praise thee as we ought. Lord, help us to give praise and glory to you. We do ask you might help us and enable us in this this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Simon. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's good uh, to be here this morning. And uh, so notices a little bit um, <coughs> different to probably what we saw last week. Um, as we see, we've got Steve here this morning. So there's a few swaps and changes over uh, the Friday and Saturday, uh, just because of um, various people not being able to do services. So we've got Steve this morning. Um, hopefully, Joe, that's not changed yet, has it? <laughs> no, you're here. That's good. So uh, Joe early tonight um, down at Glen Hills Cork Lane at 6.30, looking forward to that. And uh, at Barton, again, that was supposed to be uh, Phil Leeson, but um, Paul Liversuch, um, he's a friend of Derek's who's, who's been and preached there before. And uh, so we're thankful for him uh, stepping in at very last minute uh, as well. So uh, as Steve has mentioned, please continue to pray for those um, we know this week who are, have been uh, suffering and uh, obviously got uh, COVID at the moment. And uh, so that's today. Glen Tots tomorrow, 10 a.m. Discover 6 p.m. Team Football 6 p.m. as well. Pray for them. And uh, again, this is the last week before the summer holidays start. So, um, so these are going to be the last times. So there might be some special things going on during those times tomorrow. So uh, if you're involved in them, look forward to them. Uh, so please continue to pray for them. Tuesday night, Bible study and prayer uh, here in the church, at 8 o'clock. Wednesday, Beyond Belief, 7.30. Uh, prayer meeting on Zoom at 8 o'clock on Thursday. And then the YLN Teens, uh, Teens and Twenties on Friday. Uh, sorry? At Arnsby this week, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so that is at Arnsby uh, this week, uh, if you go into that. Uh, next Sunday, at the moment, um, this is the plan. Um, so Youth Second Breakfast here at 10 o'clock. 11 a.m. Family Service, Phil Leeson. And uh, then a special time next week, uh, a barbecue at the Hardins at, at 4.30, next Sunday afternoon, 4.30. Uh, it's on Collerton Road, Wigston. Um, if you want the address, go and see them. Um, we'll put it in the WhatsApp as well. I'm sure they don't want their full address posted out on YouTube this morning. So um, if you want their address, um, we'll put it out on the WhatsApp. But it's on Collerton Road uh, in Wigston, not too far away, next week at 4.30. Uh, Sunday the 10th uh, of July and um, then at Barton uh, in the morning is Paul Wally from Odeby uh, so if you can be praying uh, for them. Key dates then for your diary, I'm sure there's going to be loads of key dates for individuals with camps and beach missions and various different things going over uh, the summer and uh, if you're involved in them, you, you'll certainly have those etched in your mind and when you're going and travelling and things like that. Uh, so please continue to pray for each other uh, as we do that. But the guest barbecue, the 10th of July, uh, Glen Parva Gala, 6th of August. Where is, where's, oh, there's Judith. What's going on there, Judith? <laughs> Oh, right, yep. So if you don't do the whole session, have a good time. 11 o'clock setting up. It doesn't start till 1 o'clock. And then we need to help with taking a seat down again at 4 o'clock and bring it all back to church. What you can do, you don't have to do just commit yourself for the whole afternoon. It's quite a nice half afternoon. And I've heard that these ball things, you know, it's all. Oh, there you go. Not for us. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> thank you, thank you, Judith. So yeah, please, if you can get involved in that, that'd be really great. And then the Barton Kids Camp, um, which is just before that, um, the 2nd to the 5th of August. 26 children booked on so far, uh, so that is really, really good. Uh, so please pray for them. And then, um, obviously, we know we go through our, our missionaries each each week. It's really good to remember them at this time. They'll be coming at some busy times. Anthony and Rena in Israel, Jonathan and Annette Gilmore, um, Italy, uh, Daniel and Elizabeth Moore, uh, UK training, mission training, Hisham and Elizabeth in France. Now, we're hoping, um, I think there's still some plans going on, that Hisham and Elizabeth and their family uh, are going to come here. prayer I'll pray and uh, then hand back over to Steve our God and Heavenly Father it is a privilege uh, to be able to be together this morning uh, we especially pray for those who can't be with us for various different reasons uh, but Lord pray for recovery uh, and comfort uh, for our friends uh, and loved ones uh, today uh, Lord we look forward uh, to what we have over these next few weeks uh, and months. Some may be anticipation on the camps and the beach missions and other things that's going on. Uh, so we do pray, uh, Lord, for peace as people get ready uh, for all those kinds of things. Uh, and Lord, we just thank you for these, these people who you've sent out uh, into this world of ours to go and proclaim the good news uh, further afield. Uh, so we do pray for them, help them this day uh, as they meet together, uh, look after them, bless them uh, as they speak your word to many different people um, in all their different situations, we pray. And uh, we do pray for power uh, as the word goes out, uh, power for changed lives, uh, for people to turn to Jesus. Uh, so we pray especially uh, for these missionaries, pray for us. Uh, as we look to the gala, a great opportunity uh, to talk to people and meet people in that local area. Uh, pray for the camps, the barbecues, Lord, everything that's going on. And just pray uh, that Jesus' name will be spoken and heard by many people uh, over these summer months, we pray. Bless this service now. Help us from the youngest to the eldest uh, to hear your voice speaking to us today, we pray. In your wonderful and precious name. Amen. Thank you. <coughs> okay, right, boys and girls, can you give me this so I can see where you are? Okay, good, good, good. Uh, let me... Ah, good. That's the button. And uh, Simon has let me borrow the uh, Discoverer's Sweets this morning just to help concentrate some minds. And uh, I do have a reputation for getting rid of these a bit too quick as far as Simon's concerned anyway. But now, have a look at this. There are some times in life where we see something that makes us pull a face like this. Oh, can you give me a whoa oh, face? Yeah, okay. thanks, Joe. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, sometimes we see things that are absolutely awesome. So here are some things in the world that are apparently awesome to see. Number one, um, the Northern Lights. Who would like to see the Northern Lights? Yeah, Mrs. Dennis has been nagging me for years. Not nagging, but I know that Beck would like to see the Northern Lights. I need to take her before someone else takes her. Um, the Northern Lights apparently are awesome to look at. All about this might be a, a bit of a niche one, this one, okay? Uh, a Formula One car. Whoa. Now, I once went to London when the Formula One cars but still had proper engines. They kind of screamed along. Me and another short guy, we went into London in the kind of um, the money area uh, where all the buildings were close together. We got out the tube 
were kind of shuffled in the crowd like this, and we couldn't actually see the cars because we were too short. But the sound was amazing. It filled us with the kind of ooh, tingles of, wow, that's awesome. Maybe just a bit niche, all right? This one, I think, won't be niche. Who likes food? Okay. Who likes burgers? Yeah, okay, okay. Look at this for a burger and a half. Whoa! Look at the size of that! Could you imagine having a burger like that? Whoa, that'd be amazing. Now, the Bible talks about someone who is awesome. The psalm that we open our services carries on and says this, Come and see what God has done, how awesome his works in man's behalf. Now, who can put up their hand and tell me? <laughs> Hang on, we've made that mistake before. Uh, for a, a, a fruit teller, okay, what are some of the awesome things that God has done on man's behalf? Any suggestions? Okay, you don't have to be under 11 for this. Fruit tellers are good, but watch out for the fillings. All right, Pippa. Made the death alive. Made the death, dead, the death alive. Thank you, You've brought people back tonight. That is an awesome thing. Caleb. Turn water into wine. Great, that's another awesome thing. Uh, Zoe. Water, water, awesome thing. Guys. Sorry? It was the water. Okay, very good. Leo? Stop the storm. Stop the storm. Oh, good throw, bad catch. Okay, any other suggestions? Like, genuinely, this is for a, uh, a purple fruit <coughs> teller. These, these are good. Yeah, because. You have water? Yeah, why not? We're failing. What? <laughs> there. He's healed people, thank you. Any more? I would throw one to the Leesons, but uh, I'm not sure that it will make it through the camera. Okay, yeah, all, all amazing things, awesome things that God has done. And this psalm goes on to talk about one from the Old Testament. So when God's people are being rescued out of Egypt, they're running away from the Egyptians, they get to this great big piece of water, the Egyptians were charging up behind them, 600 chariots full of soldiers are chasing them down. And what does God do? He does this. He turned the sea into dry land, and they passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him, says the psalmist. We should rejoice, right? And they did when they got to the other side. But there's more. Because our awesome God is the king who reigns over all. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. He watches over us. He's the king who rules over everything, which is great. But actually, this is quite shocking. Because though he's the king who rules over all the nations and his awesome power, do you know what he did? There was a day when he set his awesome power aside and willingly went and died on the cross for us. And that is the most awesome thing that he has done on man's behalf. And as a result, we should, here he comes, we should praise our God, O peoples, O nations, let the sound of his praise be heard. When we know about how awesome God is, we don't just want to know it in our heads, we want to let it out through our hearts and our voices as we sing praise to him. So let's try and do that this morning. As grown-ups, as boys and girls, you know, I know there's only a handful of you, but I love it when we can hear you down here singing up there. It thrills my heart because God is awesome and he's worth singing about. And we're going to sing again. We're going to sing and then, boys and girls, you're off to um, Sunday school. And we're going to sing number 375, Tell Out My Soul. And, boys and girls, the last verse is about you. The last verse says, tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord to children's children. We're singing about your children. There's a scary thought. Your children. We want them to know about Jesus too. So let's stand and sing number 375, tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. And boys and girls, when we've sung, you can head up to Sunday school.
We hope you have a good time. We look forward to hearing you singing. And uh, we're going to come to our Bible reading time now. And uh, in a slight change to the plan, uh, we're going to go to the book of Haggai, Haggai chapter 1. Now, Haggai is one of those books that's quite hard to find, and this is how to find it. If you go to find the book of Matthew, all right, and when you get to Matthew, go towards the front one, and you get to Malachi. When you get to Malachi, go forward another one, you get to Zechariah. When you get to Zechariah, go forward one more, but not too much, it's only two pages long, you get to the book of Haggai, okay? So we're going to be looking at Haggai chapter one. Uh, when you found it, give me a nod, especially those who are reading on the phone, so I, I know you found it. I don't want to leave anybody behind. And we're going to be looking at this chapter this morning. So in Haggai chapter 1, we read this. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your panelled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have so much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, and behold, it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills. On the grain, the, what, the new wine, the oil, and what the ground brings forth on man and beast and on all their labours. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came 
and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. Well, please keep a bookmark in there. We're going to come back to that passage in just a moment. Uh, But before we do so, we're going to sing once more. We're going to sing 119, 119, Hear the Call of the Kingdom. to begin by a quick uh, exercise of imagination and uh, for some of you this is going to really stretch the imagination but we can try uh, imagine you're a youngster that's not all a youngster who enjoys playing football in the back garden okay and there you are playing football with your mates uh, and the ball drops at just the right height about here for you to absolutely level the ball towards the goal and in my experience, it's one of those rare occasions where you hit the ball really sweetly. And it kind of pings off your foot, arcing towards the goal, around the defender, aiming for the top corner. But then, you sadly realise that not only is the ball going over the bar, but now it's heading towards the kitchen window again. And the ball is now travelling in that kind of slow motion moment as you wiggle your head, trying to get the ball to change directory. Obviously, wiggling your head is not going to change the directory of the ball. The ball hits the the window. The ball compresses. The window flexes. Everything pauses for half a second, followed by that shattering sound of a thousand pieces of glass spraying across the kitchen worktop. And then you hear the three words that you dread most in life. Stephen Paul Dennis! Like, when your mother middle names you, you know you're in trouble, right? That is the only purpose for a middle name, because it tells you you have now reached the next level of being told off. Now, depending on what family you're from, the punishment might vary, but there was a time when you had the super nanny. Do you remember the super nanny TV programmes? And her favourite punishment was uh, time out on the naughty step, right? 
And as the condemned child sits on the naughty step, part of the purpose of that time on the naughty step was for them to give careful thought to their ways. Now, we may not have broken any windows this morning, not recently anyway, but actually, there are times when we need to stop and consider and give careful thought to our ways. In fact, that's the whole point of the book of Haggai. See, Haggai wants Israel to, give, to consider their ways. See, four times he tells them, chapter 1, verse 5, chapter 1, verse 7, chapter 2, verse 15, and chapter 2, verse 18. In just these two chapters, four times they're told to stop and to consider their ways. And that's what we're going to be doing this morning. We're going to join Israel as we consider three things. We're going to consider what, how, and why. Specifically, what our priority in life should be, how to make that priority the priority, and why we should make that thing the priority of our lives. So first of all then, let's think about, well, what should our priority be? You see, for Israel then, they had the wrong priority. See if you can spot it in verses 1 to 4. Have a look with me, see if you can spot it as we read them. In verse 1 we read, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts. And by the way, the whole way through Haggai, we got this reference to the Lord of hosts. Your version might speak of the Lord Almighty. It's there to remind us he's the king who reigns over all, the ultimate authority. Verse 2, thus says the Lord of hosts. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in panelled houses while this house lies in ruins? Can you see what their priority has been? They're prioritising building luxurious panelled houses while the temple lies in ruins. We see it again in verse 9. Have a look look with me at verse 9. Verse 9 says, you looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. And so Israel, they've prioritised building luxurious houses whilst the temple lies in ruins. Now, for this to make a bit more sense, we need to get an idea of now, where are we in the big picture of the Bible? Now, where does Haggai sit in the big picture of the Bible story? And it sits just here, okay? In 2 Chronicles chapter 36, we get the description of how the temple is destroyed and God's people are sent into exile. They're sent out of the promised land into exile. The temple's destroyed and they are there in exile for 70 years. Then if you turn over the next page in your Bible, you get to Ezra chapter 1. And in Ezra chapter 1, they come back from exile after 70 years. And then in Ezra chapter 3, they start to rebuild the temple of the Lord. And they, they lay the foundations and there's an altar there. But by the time we get to Ezra chapter 4, because of opposition and discouragement, they've stopped building the temple. And then after 18 years... Haggai comes and speaks. And in that 18 years, they've not done any temple building. But they've been building luxurious homes. Now don't get me wrong, it's not wrong for them to come back from exile and to build a home, somewhere to live. Do I need to change microphone device? It is on, but it does have a strange flashing audio thing. I don't know what that means. I'll carry on then, as we were. Okay? It's not wrong for them to be in exile for 70 years and to come back and to build a home. That's not the problem. But what they have done is built panelled houses, luxurious houses. They've given all their time and money and effort to build their home rather than carry on rebuilding the temple. Now let's have a think about this. 
What does it mean? What does it tell us about their relationship with God if they've managed to use all their time and money and effort to build their homes whilst the temple lies in ruins? Because the temple was the place where they would go to, to seek forgiveness for sin. The temple was the place where they would go to to give thanks and to worship and praise and glorify God. But they've not rebuilt the temple. So surely it shows that actually when it comes to their relationship with God, it's not great. They'd rather build a pale, luxurious house than build the place to be with God. And let's just sow a quick thought here. If the way they use their time and money to build their luxurious houses as opposed to building the temple reveals a poor attitude about their relationship with God, actually, how does the way in which we use our time and money and effort, what does that tell us about our relationship with God? And we'll come back to that a bit later. But for now, these Israelites, they prioritise building luxurious houses while the temple lies in ruins. And as a result... The Lord is sending them a wake-up call through the prophet Haggai. You can see it here in verse 5. In verse 5 we're told, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. They're on the naughty step. You have so much and have harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who, does, uh, he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Are we doing a switcheroo? It's the weekend for substitutions. Take it. All right. Don't put it too far down the shirt or else you get into trouble. Okay, the Lord has graciously sent them a wake-up call. Verse 5. Um, you have so much and half so little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Now, as they consider their lives on the naughty step, what do they see? Lives that are unsatisfying, that are barren and empty. They've broken their backs planting, but they've, they've harvested little. Their meals leave them feeling hungry. Their drinks never quench their thirst. They put on clothes, but they're never warm. When they have money, it's gone already. And why? Verse 9, you looked for much and behold, it became little. When you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, verse 10, the heavens above you have withheld the dew. And the earth has withheld its produce. And I've called for a drought on the land and the hills. This is echoes of Deuteronomy 28. Uh, The curses here. I've called for a drought on the land and the hills. On the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast and all their labours. So look, putting all this together, Israel, they're to consider their ways. And as they do, they can see how unsatisfying life has become because God has responded to their poor priorities by removing their blessings as our wake-up call to them. Actually, in the same way, our lives would be unsatisfying if we prioritise the wrong things. Therefore, both they, then, Israel, and we now, need to have the right priorities in life. And what is God's priority? Well, it's to be building the temple. That we see this in verse 7. In verse 7, uh, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house. So Haggai's message is simply this. It's time to stop building your luxurious houses and time to start building the temple. be and that's the answer to what our priority should be but how do we do that i mean does it mean we need to send a team to fly out to jerusalem and start rebuilding the physical temple does it mean we need to sort of do more projects like glen hills and and do more building of buildings with stone and bricks and the nigel may type stuff is that what it means because We need to understand how. How do we build the temple today? 
if we understand that, we understand the application of, of the book of Haggai in all its fullness. So what is it to be building the temple today? Well, to answer that question, uh, we need to go to, uh, uh, we need to understand what the temple is for the New Testament believer, for us today. So we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2. So leave a bookmark in Haggai, because Haggai is hard to find again. Uh, leave a bookmark in the book of Haggai, and we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, we're going to be in there for a few minutes, so come with me, it'll be worth the trip. As we read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22, uh, listen out for the building type language that's being used in these verses. So Ephesians chapter 2, and verse 19, says this. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 says, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation, there's building language, of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, building language, in whom the whole structure, building language, being joined together, more building language, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. The temple. What is the temple? In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Did you spot the building language there? In verse 21, there's a structure being built together into the Lord's temple. What is that structure made of? It's made of you, believer, this morning. You also, verse 22, are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That means this then. What is the temple today? The temple today is the, the believer who's indwelt by the Spirit and united with other believers in Christ. People are what make up the temple today. And that means this. If the temple is built of believers then how do we build the temple today? We build it by doing two things. We build it by doing mission and maturity. You see, we build up the temple through the mission of bringing people to know Christ. They're like another brick in the wall, but not like the soul. All right? As people become Christians, as they put their trust in Jesus, they're indwelt by the Spirit, and the temple, the New Testament temple, is getting bigger. It's growing. So how do we build the temple? By doing mission. But not just mission, but we build the temple by doing maturity. Encouraging one another to grow up in Christ. And we can see this if we just turn over the page in Ephesians chapter 4. <coughs> you see, in Ephesians chapter 4, we read about how we are to be encouraging one another to grow up in Christ. So in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, we read, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Okay? We have been given that gag of people to be, to, so that we can be equipped to do a work of ministry. What is that work of ministry? For the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, we've been given that list there of the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip us to encourage one another to grow up and to be built up in the faith. And we know it's an each other thing from chapter 4, verse 29. Last verse in Ephesians chapter 4. You see, in chapter 4, verse 9, we see that when we speak, we're to speak to build one another up. Paul says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for what? For building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. That we have a responsibility here this morning. If you have a believer, if you're a believer, you have a responsibility to build up and encourage other believers. So look, if the priority of our lives is to be building the temple, 
then our lives will be characterised by doing mission and maturity. Okay? And it's here that we're going to go back to Haggai chapter 1 and verse 7. So turn back there with me. If you've got a paper Bible, it'll be nice and quick. If you're on your phone, good luck getting through all the buttons quick enough. Or maybe just press the back button, I don't really know. Look, here in chapter, chapter 1 and verse 7... We're called to consider our ways. Chapter 1, verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring the wood and build the house, he says. They're to consider how they're living and then go and build. That's exactly what we should be doing this morning. We should consider our lives. So let's think about this. How does building the temple today fit into your priority list in your life. You see, if building the temple today is a priority in our life, then their mission and maturity will be something that happens in every area of our lives. And here are three examples of different areas of our lives. So work life, family life, and the other stuff. All right? I'm not quite sure how to categorise the other stuff. But First of all, when it comes to the workplace, look, if we live lives that prioritise mission and maturity, then our lives look very different from the world around us. So if you think about the workplace, you've got one of two extremes of workers. And one of them particularly is the worker who lives their life to go up the career ladder and to earn more money, money, money. Yeah? You ever seen people like that? I know I have. And they give all their time and effort into working their way up the career ladder. And the career ladder is the thing that controls the decisions they make in their lives, where they live, what jobs they take. They, they'll take a, a harder, more stressful, probably un, less enjoyable job just to get more money to go up the career ladder. Have you met people like that? I know I have. Now look, don't get me wrong. It, it's good to have a job. It's biblical to have a job, right? And it's great to be promoted. It's good to be well paid. But let's not allow good priorities to replace God's priority in our lives. You see, if mission and maturity is the priority in our lives, then our work life will be characterised by Titus chapter 2. No need to turn there, but this is what Paul says to slaves in Titus chapter 2. This is how slaves should live. This is what he says, Titus chapter 2 verse 9. Slaves should be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering. What a great ESV word that is. Uh, the NIV says not stealing. Um, so that, okay, so, so workers, work well, okay, don't be a thief, work hard, work, be pleasing to your boss. Why? So that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our saviour, or as the NIV says, we live in such a way that we will make the teaching about God our saviour attractive. Look, if we are doing mission and maturity in the workplace, then you are going to want to be the best employee you can be to make the teaching about God attractive, which means two things. It affects how you work, but also what you say. Because how are we going to make the doctrine of God attractive if we're not actually sharing it and speaking it, right? So look, if we want to prioritise mission and maturity in the workplace, then let's be praying for and inviting our colleagues to come to the many and various mission opportunities that we have here at Glencroft. It's, a, it's an easy win for us, isn't it? Do you like food? Come to a meal and there'll be a gospel message. It, it's an attractive thing for people to come to. So look, God's priority for our lives is that we'll be doing mission and maturity. We can do that in our work lives, but what about in our family lives? Mission and maturity should be the, the priority in there as well. And again, if it is, then our family lives will look very different from the world around us. You see, the world presents the perfect family and the perfect parenting as something that results in children that have got straight A stars. They can play music to grade eight and they're, you know, on the way to the Olympics because they're so athletic, right? That's the way the kind of world portrays family life. And there's nothing wrong with uh, academic achievement or being artistic or athletic. They're good things. But we shouldn't let good priorities replace God's priority. Actually, if we're doing mission and maturity in a family, then our priority is to, to see our children come to know Christ and grow up in Christ, as far as it depends on us. Now, our families should, be, should echo the words of Deuteronomy chapter 6 that says... These words that I command you today should be on your heart, first of all. 
And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Now, to be building the temple in the home, to be doing mission and maturity in the home, means we have God's word on our hearts, coming out of our lips, into the ears of our children. Now, look, these examples show how actually radically different it is to do mission and maturity in our, in our everyday lives, in the workplace, in the family. What about the other stuff that people do? And, you know, insert whatever you do or whatever people do for other. You see... But the big picture is this. People always live for better, 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 whatever that thing might be. So if they're a golfer, then it's a better handicap. If they're a runner, then it's a better time. If they're a gardener... We need to be careful not to allow good priorities of improving a golf handicap or better potatoes or wherever it might be to replace God's priorities. You see, like Israel, these, his, his priority for our lives is that we build the temple by doing mission and maturity, which means we use our time and money and effort to share the gospel and to build one another up. What's not to like, right? Now, in Haggai chapter 1, verse 7, the Lord has called his people to consider their ways and respond by building the temple. And that's going to be hard work for them. You know, they've got to go up to the hills. I like that. In my head, presumably, all the easy wood to find is all have been put in their houses. Now, they've now got to go up the hills, bring down the wood, and build the house. It's going to be hard for them to do. And actually, we know, don't we, that doing mission and maturity in everyday life it's a hard thing to prioritise. There will be days when you get home from work and you land on the sofa and you're like, I've got to go and do that thing, whatever that thing might be at church. And sofa gravity is a real thing, isn't it? Yeah? But more seriously than just feeling tired, actually we find it hard to witness at work because we feel rejection and scorn of our colleagues. And, and you know, we've got to work with them every day. And we might invite them to a friend to an event and they give us that kind of belittling smile of, no, nah, no thanks, you're crazy, they're thinking on the inside, and it hurts. It hurts when we see family members rejecting God, perhaps after years of trying to teach them about the love of God. We find it painful to model the unconditional love of God. It takes time and energy to encourage other Christians to grow up in Christ, especially when they make as many foolish decisions as we do, right? You're like, I'm trying to encourage you, but you've done it again! And it can be a tiring, struggling thing to build the temple, to do mission and maturity. So why do we do it? Well, that's our last thing we're going to think about this morning. We've thought about the what, we're to be building the temple. We've thought about the how, through mission and maturity. What about the why? You see, getting the why right will stir up our hearts to keep going when it's hard. Getting the why right will protect us from... from being loaded with guilt and failure, but it should motivate us and stir us to keep going. So why? Why then do we do this? Do we build the, build the temple? And there's three reasons why. And the first is that it's pleasing to God. Have a look at verse 8 with me. Or oh, starting verse 7, sorry. Thus says, Who the Lord of hosts consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring the wood and build the house, why that I may take pleasure in it. You see, Israel are to build the temple because it will please God in the same way. Have you ever thought about the fact that whenever you are sharing the gospel, whenever you're encouraging someone else to grow up in Christ and to continue in their walk, whenever you make it out of that sofa and get to that club or event, whatever it might be, it is pleasing God when you do that. That should give you a spring in the step, right? So look, let's be motivated to keep going. Why? Because it is pleasing to God. 
Secondly, because again, verse 8, it is glorifying to God. Look, verse 8 says, Go up to the hills and bring the wood and build the house, that I may take pleasure in it, and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. And that's because when the temple is finally built, he will literally be glorified there. God's people will go there and they will offer sacrifices for uh, repentance of their sin. Sacrifices to say a thank you and to worship and praise and glue him the glory that is due to his awesome name. As we looked at with the children, he will literally be glorified through their works. In the same way, God is glorified when people turn to Christ and when people are growing up in Christ. He's glorified through their lives. So let's continue to do it. So why? Firstly, it's pleasing to God. Secondly, it's glorifying to God. And then thirdly, we keep going, even when it is hard, and it will be hard, even when it's painful, and it is painful, we keep going because God is with you. And we see that from the last part of the story of Haggai here. So the story goes like this. They've been building their panelled houses. The Lord says, consider your ways. They've considered their ways. They should be building the temple. And then in verse 12, we read this. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and all the remnant of the people obeyed. They obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God has sent him. And the people fear God. They have obeyed God. And now, now they've obeyed him, they get another message. Verse 13. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. <laughs> now remember, who, how is the Lord described throughout the book of Haggai? The Lord of hosts. Or the Lord Almighty in your version. The Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts, the Lord who created the heavens and earth just by speaking. The Lord who created his promised people uh, and rescued them out of Egypt and brought them through uh, the, the desert into the promised land. He is with them. The sovereign Lord who has the power to raise up a king, to take them out into exile, to raise up another king, bring them back from exile. That sovereign Lord is with them and he is with us as well. We know that here from the book of Haggai, but, but we know that too, don't we, from, from the Great Commission. Words that I'm sure are familiar to many of us here this morning. What did we read about in Matthew 28, verse 18? And Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He is the Lord Almighty. He is the Lord of hosts. He has authority over everyone and everything. And he says to you, Go. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, he says, I am with you always to the end of the age. The one who has authority in heaven and on earth is with you always to the very end. Shouldn't that stir up our hearts? When it is hard and difficult and we are scared and hurt, the Lord is with you. So you make it out of the sofa and you get to that club. The Lord is with you when you have that horrible moment, that gloriously horrible moment, when the opportunity to talk about Jesus lands in your lap in the workplace. Everybody turns. It kind of goes silent. And you know you've got to speak say something but suddenly it feels like your mouth is full of marbles have you ever had that feeling and you're like oh do i spit them out do i swallow them you try and say something you feel foolish and sweaty the lord is with you at that moment the lord is with you when you face scorn from family members who think you are crazy for following jesus the lord is with you as you feel pain as you see young people turn their back on jesus he is with you even when it hurts and it is hard and surely this should thrill us and stir us up. And that's just what happens here from the nation of Israel. They're stirred up. Look at verse 14. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And what did they do? They came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. 
You see, they have given careful thought to their ways. And they have obeyed. And because they have obeyed, they know the Lord is with them. And they are stirred up to do what? To work, to build the temple in the same way. Let's give careful thought to our ways. What is the priority of our lives? Well, let's make it building the temple, doing mission and maturity, using all our time and energy and effort to, to share the gospel, to see people coming to know Christ and growing up in Christ. And why? Because it pleases God when we do that. Why? Because he's glorified, even through us. He's amazing. He's glorified when it happens. And he is with us and will stir up our hearts to keep going. Even when it's tough, the Lord is with you always and forever to the end of the age. So let's give careful thought to our ways and let's seek to make prioritising at mission and maturity, building the temple as a priority in our lives. And we're going to sing once more. Uh, we're going to sing number, wait for it, it's coming. Number 174, uh, a hymn of response, and thank you to Claire for suggesting these this morning. Um, number 174, I will offer up my life in spirit and truth. We'll sing this, and then please remain standing as I just read through the words of a hymn to uh, close in prayer this morning. Just pray through some words of Charles Wesley, who wrote this. Oh, that the world might taste and see the riches of his grace, the arms of love that compass me, would all mankind embrace. His only righteousness I show, his saving, saving truth proclaim. Tis all my business here below, to cry, behold, the Lord. And Lord, we do ask you might help us to join with Wesley and to sing that and pray that and mean that and do that. In Jesus' name, amen.